and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Megacast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information to cover with you. Let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. Now, if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Also, keep in mind that if you have any tech issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's megacast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all of your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. And if we do not get to your question during the webinar, don't worry, because the awesome experts that we have here with us today will be following up with you after we wrap. All right, next up on our tour, there are going to be lots of cool aha moments in the megacast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there in your audience console and the hashtag for today's megacast will automatically get added to your post. And our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection of solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. And if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes we will be giving away throughout the Megacast today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. You do need to be in attendance here live at the webinar in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all winners after we wrap the Megacast today. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, hey, if you're not sure what those are, no problem. You can find the full T's and C's in that handouts tab. Again, just click into the handouts section, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find the full T's and C's waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember here today is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. In today's megacast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all the questions asked after the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about winning and we will get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the Megacast today and we wanna keep that good feeling going. So let's connect on social. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content right away after we wrap, you wanna jump right in, make sure that you subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and to grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you're gonna find a link to do that right there in that handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected after we wrap today. Now, both you and your coworker, your friend could win a prize, and we actually hold those drawings every month. So be sure you refer somebody awesome before you head out today. It could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab and fill out the application. Then the actual tech crew will match you with some vendors that we think you should be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you can choose to join in, like surveys or test running new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you will learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply or, hey, send that link to a decision maker in your team. Now, I want to take a quick minute here to remind you about one of my favorite resources, and that is ransomware.org. You can find everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, how to prevent and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. So go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books offered by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books are gonna work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and they are completely free, super easy. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in the handouts tab as well. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get rolling. All righty. Hello and welcome, folks. It is shaping up to be a fantastic megacast today as we kick off our IT Innovations Day, exploring the tools, products, and services that enable the future. Today, we are going to look at what's on the horizon, peer into the future, if you will, and discuss the tools, products, and services that are shaping the future of technology. If you're like me and you get excited by cutting edge innovations, well, you came to the right place. Our expert presenters will be sharing what tools they're using and developing in order to transform IT operations, enhance productivity, and drive digital transformation. Together, we'll discover how these emerging technologies can be leveraged to optimize and sorry, to optimize your organization's IT strategy and stay ahead in a competitive market. We have speakers from Couchbase today, Rubrik, Cohesity, and Peer Storage joining, as well as a fantastic keynote from Trevor Pott. I imagine you are all ready and pumped up to begin, and we have a boatload of information to share today. So we will get rolling here with just a few last little bits of info, and then we're going to get our speakers on out here with us. All right, so very quickly, a big welcome from me. My name is Mackenzie Puttisi, and I am a moderator here at Actual Tech Media. And my friends and fellow moderators, Jess Steinbach, Scott Becker, and Keith Ward are here with us on live chat today. And in more exciting news, well, we've got some prizes. And I do mean prizes. Look at this lineup. Today on the Megacast, you could win one of three Apple iPad Pros, and we'll be giving away a $300 Amazon gift card every 30 minutes during today's event. A reminder that you must be present and live with us at the Megacast to win. And as mentioned in the housekeeping video this morning, you can find the full T's and C's linked in the handouts tab if you have any questions about that. Now, just when you thought that was impressive, I am yet again going to up the ante. Each session today has a $50 best question gift card up for grabs. So make sure you are sending in your thoughtful questions and are active in the chat today. In fact, just to make sure you are all alive and awake out there, why don't you find that questions tab now and send your energy and excitement around to your fellow attendees with a big hi, hello, howdy, hola, aloha, bonjour, or any greeting of your choice right now. Now you may need to expand the questions and handout window to get a better view of that. And you're also gonna notice in the handouts tab, there are a bunch of great resources from our presenting teams today. So you may wanna grab those early and have them all bookmarked and downloaded for safekeeping, but I will also call those out later in today's webinar. One other thing I'd like to call your attention to there in the handouts tab is a link for the Future Focus 2025 survey. Actual Tech Media and IT Pro with our parent company, Future B2B, have launched a survey for the month of October to gather information and insights about the tech industry, specifically from IT professionals. So why should you participate? Well, a few reasons. It only takes about 15 minutes. You'll also be able to influence industry reports that guide tech professionals and decision makers. You're going to receive exclusive access to the survey's findings, identifying key trends and opportunities. You're going to contribute to a stronger, more information-heavy tech community with your voice. And you will also be entered to win a $1,000 gift card upon survey completion. All the details are in the link in the handouts tab, so I invite you to complete that after today's webinar. And with that, I think it is time to get this show on the road. Today, I'm excited to introduce our awesome keynote speaker, Trevor Pott. Trevor is a solutions architect. You may already know this IT thinker and powerhouse, but if not, you are in for a treat. With that, I'm going to hand things over to you, Trevor. Take it away. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. And uh, welcome everyone to uh, this IT Innovations Day. Um, my name is Trevor Pott, and uh, I have been asked to do a bit of a keynote here 
on essentially trends that I think might define uh, IT in the next decade. Now, as you can probably imagine, AI has to be at the top of any of those discussion uh, lists, not least of which because it is the hype of the moment. Um, but I think from the practical standpoint, for those of us who actually work in IT, um, our biggest challenge related to AI is going to be dealing with the fallout of AI being used inappropriately. Um, this is not me being an AI doomer uh, so much as it is perhaps being a people doomer. Uh, it, machine learning in general, uh, most of the different types of uh, algorithms and neural networks and so forth that we lump together under artificial intelligence, they have real world uses. They can accomplish things that uh, are not feasible for people to do. Um, and just as realistically, they can and will be misused. Uh, in some cases, such as deep fakes, um, this is going to be deliberate misuse. In many others, such as companies deciding to replace people with AI and then doing it badly, uh, that may be uh, less directly malicious as, as an intent, but it can have some very serious consequences that we are going to have to deal with. A great example of this is um, the easiest set of jobs to replace with any new automation tool are the simplest jobs in any given sphere. Um, for us in IT, there's going to be the entry level jobs. In, in most places, there's going to be the entry level jobs. We run the risk of experiencing a serious skills shortage simply because we don't have enough new people coming in to learn the things. Uh, and we've seen this before in tech. Uh, you know, we still have significant chunks of the world that run on COBOL. And uh, there aren't a heck of a lot of COBOL programmers out there more now perhaps than there used to be a few years ago uh, after some concerted efforts to deal with the problem. But uh, we are going to have to spend the next decade dealing with the fallout of these poor decisions and unwillingness to invest in um, the next generation of talent. And the sort of third element that I think is going to be a, a very real problem with regards to AI is um, the resource usage, resource usage of tech in general, uh, but the resource usage of AI is uh, drawing a lot of uh, awareness and it is uh, becoming something of a political football, which is going to put a lot of pressure on IT teams everywhere to prove that they are being uh, energetically responsible. Um, and that is going to change into another domain that uh, IT people have to be aware of. Just just another set of rules and regulations, another set of uh, spreadsheets to track, but also you know a deeper understanding that we're going to have to develop over time. Um, another trend that I really think is going to um, impact us over the next decade is the fact that we are making our chips as small as we can. Uh, we are getting to the point that uh, the transistors are only a handful of atoms in size, uh, you know, or at least the smallest elements uh, on our various uh, chips. And this is going to lead to yet another change in, you know, much in the way that that multi-core was a change uh, when we stopped being able to go faster with our existing technology. We stopped the gigahertz Hertz wars. We started going into the core wars. Um, now we're going to do sort of two things. One, we're probably going to see changes in the underlying uh, semiconductor substrate. So possibly the adoption of things like graphene um, in order to be able to push the gigahertz up faster, 
and and higher because that's really the only place we have to play. We can't continue to make the process smaller. We're already at the you know minimum number of atoms, um, and we're also going to start farming out uh, functions. So we're going to have uh, more and more coprocessors. Already we have CPUs and GPUs and NPUs, and I mean this is really not that big a uh, a deal if you go back in time to like the era of the 386 and 486 you had dedicated sound processors which now uh, you know is mostly done in software but um yeah i mean we are going to see a lot more of these coprocessors as we farm as many functions off of those cpus as possible uh in order to allow the cpus to continue to be perceived as competitive um and linking these, you know, increasingly ridiculously fast chips and these clusters of chips that will make up what we think of as a computer um, is going to drive uh, ever more increasing demand for networks and buses, ways to move the bits between chips, ways, ways to move the bits between computers. And I think this is going to lead to a lot of uh, photonics. We're going to start moving bits around even in, inside our computers. Um using lasers as opposed to uh, relying on everything being electrons moving on a copper trace. This may very well affect us in terms of how we are going to have to deal with everything from uh, energy usage inside our systems to how we cool those systems, uh, how maybe even how vulnerable they are to vibration. Every big change in process technology like this uh, leads us to potentially having to deal with new environmental factors and thus having to think about uh, different ways of design, whether that's software design or even data center design. And I think um, the next uh, big change is not so much a big change as it is a dramatic escalation of a change that's already underway. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we talked about the Internet of Things until it became, you know, a buzzword that we use every day. And now we're living through it. And, and we're seeing that everything has an IP address. Absolutely everything has an IP address. Um, and this is actually changing everything about how we, ha how we have to deal with everything. So... Uh, on the one hand, we now, just like we had to, you know, learn to fix printers and we had to learn to explain phishing to people and smishing to people, um, now we're going to have to become misinformation experts and explain to people how to find information they can reliably trust and when to trust or not to trust different AIs and under what circumstances. We're just going to need to know this because they're going to expect us to know this, just like they expected us to know how to fix a printer or explain what phishing is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as all of this tech becomes more everywhere, more all around us all of the time, um, it's going to talk to everything. Like it's, everything's going to be talking to everything. And so we're going to see spectrum usage problems, too many radios talking to one another. There's going to be regulations as, you know, we have regulations that cover not just tech, but, you know the various industries that that tech is increasingly being built into and even things like consumer devices, we as IT people are going to be expected to know this, uh, just like, you know, we uh, expect car mechanics, know everything there is about a car, despite the fact that cars are, in many cases, uh, could be viewed as almost more computer or electrical system today than uh, a mechanical system. Um, we're going to go through that in tech in a very big way, where we're going to have to know uh, all about misinformation, we're going to have to know about uh, regulations, we're going to have to know about spectrum usage, and eventually we're going to have to deal with the fact that we have all of these companies out there building various flavors of Cylon, from, you know, your robot dogs that are walking around to full-blown humanoid robots powered by various types of AI that can provide that robot with um, the ability to sense and react to their environments, and we're going to have to know how to connect those robots into our networks, make sure that those robots don't present uh, any sort of risk, that they accomplish their task, that we can find them if they, you know, get lost. How are we going to fix them? Who are we going to fix them for? If nothing else, IT is going to end up being some sort of logistics and supply management for all of this extended universe of what we used to call IoT stuff and now is just stuff. 
So in short, I see the, you know, the next decade as proceeding much from where the previous one was, but um, the 2020s are the find out decade and we're going to spend a lot of it finding out. Thank you very much for taking the time and I'll throw this back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, I loved that. That really just was visionary in a sense, but also really practical and kind of got into a bit of nitty gritty, which I think everyone here probably appreciates and and would agree with. Uh, there were some some good questions that came up in the keynote. We don't have uh, Trevor sticking around for a live Q&A, but he might either grab you guys on uh, on live chat or just follow up afterwards. So thanks for shooting those out and uh, keep those questions coming in. I do have a poll up there. So if anyone out there in the audience hasn't seen it yet, uh, the poll is just asking, what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company? So are you looking to make some changes here in the next six months? Is this more of a kind of between now and end of year project, six to 12, 12 to 14, kind of one to two years out, or maybe you're just not sure. You're you're keeping yourself uh, ahead of the game, doing some research, seeing what's on the horizon, and then you're gonna make some decisions or request some budgets or uh, whatever you need to do to make those implementations happen. All right, with that, I am going to leave the poll up for just a second more, and then I have our first presenter coming on out here with us. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to have the team from Couchbase here with us in the house. We've got the awesome Tyler Mitchell, who is the Senior Product Marketing Manager over at Couchbase. And uh, a little reminder, we are going to be doing a uh, Q&A with Tyler, so keep those questions coming in. You may also get a $50 gift card. Again, uh, it may literally pay to be active and engaged, but please do send in thoughtful questions as there'll be plenty of opportunities today. And with that, uh, Tyler, I am going to kick things over to you. Are you ready? Ah, uh, Sounds good. Thanks very much. I awesome. appreciate that. And I know I was taking notes uh, from Trevor's talk as well. So I hope I'll tie some of that in for, for folks. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, get into what uh, our perspective on uh, how to get your enterprise ready for the innovations coming in the future, especially around AI innovation. And we're calling it getting future ready. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on today that's pretty exciting, but we're also building stuff for tomorrow, right? And that's uh, a little bit tied into what Trevor's talking about. You know, how do you plan for the future and how do you plan for it to be kind of responsibly used, but also accurate? Oh, yeah, and also efficient and also resource management efficient, et cetera. Oh, and we might want to be able to develop on it and manage it as an IT resource effect effectively. So there's a lot of com competing challenges here. Um, but first, I want to start off by a pretty high level uh, conversation about why 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 I will be talking about the specific architectural challenges around a cloud-based databases. The um, idea of moving to cloud obviously is nothing new and a significant amount of uh, people's workflows and IT infrastructure is now hosted in the cloud. But I thought you might find this um, results of this survey interesting for why is uh, organizations cloud strategy focusing on different areas or what areas are they focusing on? And if you go through this list of different things like uh, consolidating data, um, they're going to focus more on securing their security around the cloud resources, and they're going to adapt to uh, artificial intelligence capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all like great strategies that many large enterprises have, especially. But the irony is that this is a three-year-old slide. Um, and even back then, almost half of the respondents in that survey said they were moving to the cloud. Um, and they were specifically looking at, it, at a strategy around AI enabled analytics in the cloud, for example. So there's a lot of expectation being built that both cost optimization, data consolidation, high performance computing, all of these things are going to be delivered through cloud resources. Um, that's to say, um, we don't believe that's the only way. And we know that there's a lot of on-prem enterprises that are still using technology, especially database and AI technology that will continue forward. But um, the, the movement towards cloud strategies is not going away anytime soon. And why are people even looking at it 
uh, as a as a uh, as an option for their databases. And we're talking about databases because that's our our product and our platform is database technology. But you can plug in any kind of scalable enterprise database or a data requirement, and you'll have at least these uh, six, these eight different requirements and parameters that you have to meet. So I don't want to just talk about our tech in this talk. Um, so you can abstract this away enough and just talk about um, strategies for how to make sure that you're future proof. And anyone who's built an application and had it kind of take off in popularity or, uh, or grow a user base quickly will know that there are scalability issues. Then you have to have your application has to be highly available. If people are paying for it, they expect it to be performant. They expect there to be some kind of mobile connection to it, et cetera, et cetera. So these these are not just ideas for our database or for databases in general, but ideas for application development overall. I can guarantee if you pull out even just a couple of these items and your platform doesn't meet these requirements, you're going to really, really, really struggle in the future. If you can't scale, you can't keep up with your customer's demand. If you can't deliver a high performance product, they're not going to be happy. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you can't meet them where they're at, whether they're in the field, or on their, on their phone at the coffee shop, um, you're going to have disappointed users. So just to set that as kind of the base, why we're talking about cloud-based databases is because we're specifically trying to address all of these uh, capabilities and, and requirements so that you can build solutions on top of them and have confidence going forward. But there are some very specific architectural challenges. And I could probably just drop this slide here and uh, it speaks for itself, <laughs> I think. But uh, if we talk about the cloud side of it being the infrastructure layer, or it could be any kind of uh, enterprise IT infrastructure at the bottom there. It doesn't have to even be cloud stuff. And you talk about today's modern applications and microservices at the top, and then you've got all the different kinds of data access patterns and in many cases these are separate kinds of services and applications running in that middle tier and you start to kind of multiply the capabilities or the requirements you have for capabilities in your applications it starts to become a real uh, rat's nest or spaghetti uh, diagram here where you've got a lot going on and all of a sudden you're no longer just talking about managing a database for example or managing a search system. Now you're talking about managing three different related systems and then handing a workload over to another related set of systems and then maybe handing it off to the user then. It's a very complex uh, concept of both data sprawl, but also we call like application sprawl, that you have so many more applications in the mix. It's exponentially harder for you to manage and maintain. We'll get more into that in a minute. Oh, actually, it's a slide right here. So um, we put some some logos on here just to help you kind of level set uh, where the kind of like different uh, applications and vendors are in these spaces, which is uh, by no means like trying to diss anyone on this on this list, but just to show you the diversity of service providers and platforms that are in here. Um, and you can start to see in the bottom left, there's just there's five bullets there about the challenges that this kind of complexity leads to um, both the latency um, and the uh, deployment and management challenges for keeping all of these separate services running. Um, and we'll say, um, just for those of you that might not see why all of these different types of services would be required, um, we have many, many customers that have this, almost this complete stack of requirements in their back end. So, this isn't just to say, look, uh, everybody's going to connect to everything. It's no, it's more like these are core core data access patterns or core data services that people rely on today. But each of them has their own programming interface. Each of them has their own kind of set of data that they're moving around. Maybe they're copies of copies and caches and <laughs> different layers of data access requirements there. And that all leads to really a lot of confusion. You have additional support costs on the right-hand side here. You see the cost just goes up the more services you have in the mix. More licensing, more training. You have specialists that are just focused on specific areas of these. And, uh, and then you add in at the top right there the mobile and edge AI apps. 
and it's exponentially more complex yet again because now you're out everything has to be mobile accessible um and i didn't even talk about it specifically saying ai powered applications are going to need access to all of these kinds of services as well which may not be as obvious to us and and that uh, when we talk about where we're going with ai um and i'll I'll come back to it, um, but you can't just plug it in and plug and play, <laughs> plug it into your application and start using it. Um, in an enterprise context, AI is gonna need access to a lot more different types of services and data than we normally um, think of giving access to for one application. And then just a layer on top of that, we have this global distribution challenge. Uh, applications need to be accessible in different regions around the world. So these are just 70 of the 70 plus of the cloud regions that our platform is running on. There's more that's possible, of course, but the challenge is exponentially larger again. Now, not only do you need all those services running, all of them accessible on mobile and kind of web platforms and uh, all with different APIs. And now we have them across different data centers around the world. And then this is kind of my final level for complexity. Then we also need to have active copies and replicas of the information from a state of security standpoint, and that your applications can switch over uh, when there's failover or when there's a higher performing data center nearby. And the mobile application needs to be able to access the fastest, lowest latency connection to your backend as possible. That is a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, potential complexity that can make it impossible for many organizations to really get a handle on this. So we, we summarize up our platform in this way, but as you can see, these are some of the, these are pretty much generic concepts. We start at the bottom with our architectural side, so it could be an on-premise database, it could be cloud offering, but either way, it's at enterprise grade deployment with enterprise grade security on top of it. And then what we call the performance foundation. And again, if you pull, start pulling out pieces from here, even if this is your own customized platform that you're building, if you pull out any of these pieces, you're gonna have a real challenge. I won't go through each of them because th they're, they're pretty deep uh, dive on these, but for example, if you don't have a cluster map available for your applications, your applications won't know where in the cluster to go and get uh, access to the most performant piece of data. Or if you don't have an integrated cache, you're going to be building another cache on top of stuff, and then you're going to have this whole synchronization and update challenge. Um, if you remove um, the asset transactions, then you don't have that reliability uh, of, of tracking transactions over time. So the, the performance foundation is essential, and until you get that nailed down, your next higher levels are really going to struggle, especially as we add in that AI complexity, which we've barely talked about. <laughs> We get into these data access services, and these are just different kinds of ways of connecting to the same data backend, but with the service exposed differently for different end user or for different application purposes. We, we do not um, support like the idea of having a extremely diverse set of services with different from different vendors. We obviously many of our customers do have multiple vendors in the mix, and that's no big deal but it can be extremely complex if you are copying data around for different purposes just for example to enable search or just to enable time series um, our our belief is creating keeping a core platform that has your data in it and then exposes that data through these different service layers and all with the common api i think i'll come back to that in a minute and then you got those top levels of applications and mobile apps uh, connecting through to that data access layer. So this is our simplified view of it. And this is what all modern applications are going to look like. The logos at the bottom might change, um, but the service requirements, the foundational requirements are not going to change and they're only going to get more tight and more stringent. So please keep that in mind. So let's switch over to the AI story itself and what's going on here. So we're talking about developing new applications. A lot of people right now are talking about just improving their current applications incrementally. You're probably working on a project that's to ah, mix in a little AI 
into the uh, into the batter here and make it available in the existing apps. But it's really that new application design that's going to be a challenge going forward. And and many developers and IT professionals don't even necessarily know what that what that looks like, what that means. And and we we're just starting to scratch the surface on that. But we do know these things. It's extremely focused on the end user. When we start talking about chatbots, uh, it was pretty cool to see that, yeah, like uh, Copilot and co Code Gen type things are pretty powerful and exciting for developer side. But all the other interaction and uh, generative AI techniques really are for that end user to get answers to questions, to have conversations about data and things like that. But we know AI applic empowered applications are going to be everywhere. They're going to have to be responsive with low latency, which is a big deal. Um, because cur currently they're, they're not always low latency and they have to have like understand the context that the user is coming to them with. It can't be that they have to like describe their problems in detail over and over and over every time they need information or that they have to um, uh, fit just kind of one use pattern that, that needs to be aware of the user and their, and their intricacies. So we call it hyper-personalization um, is it going to be important because that's really reflects the kind of the accuracy when we talk about responsible use of AI Trevor was mentioning you know hyper personalization is actually going to be important because if we don't have an accurate view of information that's been personalized by your accurate data that you actually trust then you don't have a really solid AI foundation So just to talk through a couple of really generic use cases that we've seen already that you've probably seen. If you haven't, look, here's some terms and that the headings on here are the terms you can go and search for. But you've got the chat bots and applications with chat enabled in them. And then you have with RAG built into them, which allows you to extend beyond, say, ChatGPT's corpus of knowledge. You could add in the ability to check uh, against data in your own database using the RAG techniques. That's R-A-G. Look that up. And then obviously like copywriters and people writing content are generating text from you know com compiling and collating large volumes of data into little succinct summaries and it's and ai has been really helpful with that and then we get into more of a searching uh, capability we call it hybrid search um, semantic search vector search you'll hear all these different terms uh, we'll come back to what hybrid search means in a few minutes but the idea of searching for things that are uh, similar, it's a similarity search really, and finding things that are, whether they're visually similar, they're textually similar, um, they sound the same, those are the real game changers for um, understanding the context and semantics uh, in, in an AI query. And then we barely scratch on the surface in terms of data analysis and finding anomalies and understanding, giving AI power to really find trends and, and things like that. We've mostly been talking about the generative AI side uh, in the industry. But there's two big issues that are coming up and will, you know, there's, they're being addressed, but it's gonna take time for people to develop the trust in, in both of these areas. But sharing proprietary, proprietary and sensitive data, um, the RAG technique makes it so you can add, instead of having to build a custom model, which can be extremely challenging, you can add on to that model and give it a little more context for your own corporate data. So if you're not already doing that and you're only relying on somebody else's model to educate your um, knowledge base, then you need to be getting into reg. So there's some solutions uh, for that. And then also just how data can hallucinate in an AI model it can be very challenging to address. But again, if you're using vector search capabilities, you could actually go, go and find similarity search on your own database and this is all built into Couchbase's platform. Um, you can go in and do a vector-based search today and get back the documents that match your or are most similar to your, your question or your query. And then that reduces the, you can check that against any response that the AI had and make sure that you, it's not hallucinating. So being able to search your own data is pretty powerful and important. I know I'm running probably a little short on time here, uh, but I've only got a few more slides. The um, major architectural issues that we've seen are definitely coming forth that are going to not go away anytime soon is the, first of all, the diversity of data. While we use JSON as the primary data format for community,
communicating with AI, getting data in and out of AI. Um, we do know that obviously there's different binary sources of data and things that get encoded and embedded into AI systems, but uh, JSON really is uh, foundational for AI apps. Um, they also need to be knowledgeable. AI apps need to be knowledgeable about both your operational and your analytical data sets. It can't just be like, oh, we're building on a data set from three months ago. It needs to know what's going on in business today to really give you real-time insights. Uh, latency and complexity, those kind of speak for themselves. And then the edge and how it's involved. So mobile apps and IoT apps, et cetera, that are on the, on the edge devices really need to, are uh, really where the data is going to be consumed and produced. So that's our summary at the bottom there. AI-based applications need a scalable, distributed, high-performance, multi-model data platform. And that kind of sums up our, our data, or our platform offering. So where are we at in this phased kind of AI application modernization uh, free-for-all today? So we've kind of moved from um, th through this, through the curve of adoption here, we've got, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've got existing applications being enhanced, but we know that there's going to be new applications we haven't even dreamed of that are going to become very powerful and important. If you really want to provide, okay, this is a, a side note for those looking for a leg up in their work and in their industries. It's the new applications that are really going to change, change things around. If you can come up with new applications that take advantage of all of these different kinds of data, data access patterns, different kinds of services, you will um, shine in the future. Getting existing applications up to uh, use some AI capabilities is, is admirable, it's essential, it's part of the job description. But if you wanna look forward, you need to dream up what the new apps can do and start pitching those internally. Okay, side note, cut off here. The uh, idea that we are moving from just plug into someone else's system, get some answers, and then use it in your business. Those days are slowly going away. Models are gonna be more centralized and focused and you'll, your enterprise will have access to multiple different types of knowledge and it will be distributed across your, your set of applications and across your infrastructure. So it'll be, this is all very new concepts for most developers and IT professionals. So I mentioned earlier the idea of hybrid search. This is the real sweet spot. Um, Consider, oh, instead of just asking an AI one question, like, you know, what car is this? Or what color is this? Instead, you're going to have the idea of, oh, here's a, here's an, uh, an image. Find a color in this image. But I also want to check by my uh, product catalog for stuff that is kind of considered casual. So I've got kind of a general text matching challenge there to find what casual would be. You'll have like range searches, whether it's like star ratings or dollar values. You'll have geospatial, maybe you wanna find a store that's in a certain region, and maybe you need to check that it's even available. Um, we've all gone through these steps, one at a time at least, maybe not with the semantic vector search capabilities of matching a color and style, but we've all gone through all the other ones all the time when we're using mapping apps and booking apps, et cetera. But, by pulling them all together into in what we call a single, basically a single search query, it uh, can make your applications way more performant because you're hitting one ba one data backend, one platform that can service all of these types of queries. The alternative is that messy spaghetti diagram where you're actually going out to a search system, going out to a, a relational database system going out to a semantic vector search data system, and then having an application that combines it all. Well, uh, the, the platforms that are the, going to be the AI leaders going forward do all of this within their own platform. Um, this I won't go through because I think too, in too much detail, but I wanted to include the slide for you so you can see the steps that are required for adding the um, uh, RAG uh, capabilities on top of vector search basically how to build embedded, how to embed, create embedded vector embeddings to store in your database, and then how to query against those embeddings, and then pass the knowledge back over to an LLM to kind of summarize the response back to a user. This is pretty powerful. You can, if you um, start using our platform, 
today, you can sign up for free, and I got the link in, in a couple slides here. You can um, go through all of this process uh, in a tutorial that's linked on kind of the, the playground page that we have for, for getting started, if you want to experience this. So, so and we've got lots of blog posts on this concept. Um, so we believe there's going to be AI integration at every level in this kind of stack across all of these kinds of services and across all of these kind of uh, enterprise performance layer sides of things. And again, I, I'm not going to read through this, but I included it for your um, consumption later on. You know, whether it's storing JSON documents or ac accessing analytics, there's going to be machine learning and AI uh, mixed in all over the place. But it's going to be core. It's not going to be one service calls out to AI and gets an answer. It's going to be every little service needs to understand how to interact with it. And this is really our takeaway from where we see the future going, that it's you're not just asking one, like I was just saying, not just asking one little question, one text question, or maybe sending in a, in a photo for some identification. But it's going to be content generation, product searching, finding and uh, analyzing data, chatting with data, and all of it from like real-time web applications and mobile applications in the field. It's going to be essential that that mobile component plugs in and synchronizes it, uh, with the uh, kind of the real-time backend. So uh, that's we've invested heavily in uh, synchronization technology and that's really our sweet spot for mobile apps too. So if you need to look at uh, replacing your Realm app or something like that with a better mobile synchronization solution, it's all baked in to that architecture that we showed you before. It's not a, a kind of a third-party plugin. It's all built in core. All of this is all core to our system. And if you went back uh, t t 10 years or so, you'd see that the core that Couchbase was building was all around these enterprise performance foundation items. And now that those are done, the service layer at the top is just growing and becoming more powerful. So hopefully I've given you a bit of a blueprint, uh, hopefully not seeing it as just a, a couch based advertisement, but this is really what um, I challenge anyone to do, start pulling pieces out of this picture and still having the enterprise capabilities that they want to for the future. Um, we have a free tier, a free version of the cloud database that you can sign up and grab. Um, uh, that's that's all for me. Thanks for coming, and I look forward to your questions. Awesome, Tyler. Thanks so much. Um, we also have the link for that uh, tier sign up in the handouts tab. So if you guys want to grab that there, you can. Ah, great. Thanks. And yeah, we're, we are pushing up against time here, but let's try to address a few questions because uh, we have a lot. So uh, I think I think you got people fired up. Oh. There. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. First question I'm going to throw to you here is, uh, excuse my little notification there. Uh, why is a why is it a problem connecting AI apps to traditional platforms and architectures? Oh, well, um, I think the biggest challenge there is it's it, they're all like one-off solutions. So you'd be like, oh, I want to add AI capabilities to my relational database app. Okay. Well, now I need to add the same uh, AI capabilities to another app. And you don't have necessarily the same platform to build it on, the same backends that you're hitting. So like different AIs are useful for different purposes. Different AIs have different um, uh, programming interfaces. Different types of products have different programming interfaces. And so it becomes extremely complex. Um, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway I hope everyone has that <laughs> that they the complexity is just crazy so you need to consolidate it somehow so that you're you're building kind of building once and servicing many uh end user applications awesome yeah actually i love those final slides kind of looking at how things work in the back end and overlay because you know as a consumer there's always that sense of, oh yeah of course this makes sense but when you really look <laughs> like step under the hood you're like wow yeah there's actually a ton of complexity that's pulling together this data so mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. seeing that uh i have a question here from nick he's saying does couchbase integrate well with all the top llms uh, uh yeah so in some respect you bring your own llm at, the, at this point um we also do have an integrated 
an integrated uh, AI query builder and knowledge base built into the cloud platform. So you can actually ask it, hey, help me build a query to, to access this the data in this bucket of, of data we've got. But the um, uh, they, they w if it doesn't integrate well with the LLM you're interested in today, it will suit. So that's the idea that the customer can choose the LLMs they want. We're not pitching a specific one and we're not wedded to any specific one. Um, but we will help enable you to use what you need to use. So absolutely to, uh, top of our list to make that uh, happen. Nice. Um... Oh, I should say like we integrate with Langchain and these other I integration layers. So you can literally can bring your own LLM uh, as long as you've got one up and running. Oh, awesome. Easy peasy. Out of the box goodness. Okay, yes. someone here is asking about price. They're saying, isn't it going to be more expensive to use one kind of big product instead of multiple smaller open source pieces? Oh, I, I'm a huge, uh, you know, I come from the lamp stack days of you just had to have uh, Linux and Apache, blah, 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 and you'd build your own stack and you'd be set for life, right? Well, that's those days are gone um, with the complexity that comes into it. Um, really what you're getting for... When you look at it in terms of value, that it's kind of pre-built and ready to go, you drop your data in and then you get your data out. You can get it out through a relational query using a SQL, or you can get it out using a text-based search, or you can do a document retrieval with an ID. It's all, um, it's, it's, it's cohesive and that saves a lot of time and money. You learn one programming interface. You learn, you have one cloud product to manage the billing on. You have one set of documentation you need to access and understand. You don't need specialized developers in all of these areas um, just to keep things running. Instead, developers can spread their wings a bit more and learn more about different kinds of data access patterns instead of being pigeonholed. So no, the cost savings that we have, I'm, I didn't want it to be too markety on this slide, on these slides, but we've had customers that, you know, reduce their, uh, their, their, cost of ownership extremely uh, quickly, like very fast and sometimes up to 50% reduction in costs once you've consolidated all the resources they're using. So That's no, awesome. you can save uh, a lot of money moving to this kind of platform. And we use we have a credit system where you buy a certain number of credits and then they're, they're used for different types of things within the cloud platform. And the pricing is all uh, transparent, I think, in all, and online there, free to choose from. Amazing. Uh, there are a boatload of questions we aren't going to have time for today. So if you if you have time to stick around on the text chat and want to respond a bit, you can. But these will also be all passed on. Uh, so Sounds you and the Couchbase team can follow up uh, and make sure information is given. I am going to throw up a poll here. So anyone uh, looking for some additional information about the Couchbase solution, if you're looking for data sheets, white papers, case studies, pricing details, demos, etc., uh, just this is your easy button, your wish list, whatever you're looking for, uh, click on there and then the team will make sure that you get exactly what you need. And before I let you go, Tyler, um, last question is just if, if people are enthused, if they wanna learn more, if they wanna take some next steps, uh, where should they go, what should they do? And also anything you just wanna leave the audience with today before you take off. Yeah, sure. Um, we we recently just launched what we are calling our free tier database. So it's literally the free online database service. Uh, and it, we used to have a free trial, and a lot of companies have free trials. But this one is it's is available. It's a it's it's a smaller capacity and uh, only a single node or a smaller number of nodes. But you should get that and use it today for free, and <laughs> it's going to be there for you forever. Um, and the the, uh, you could drop, drop to the blog, the Couchbase uh, blog, and you'll see a whole ton of like in-depth tutorials on getting started with stuff like this. So uh, hopefully you'll be set with a bunch of different AI ideas so you can propel your own career forward and solve enterprise problems at the same time. That sounds great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it and a uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Alrighty, everyone. Uh, if you haven't, again, just quickly, this is your last kind of 30 seconds or so to enter that poll. Uh, also, if you do want to check out that free trial or the tier sign up, that's in the handouts tab. And again, we've got a bunch of great resources in the handouts tab there. So don't sleep on it. 
Uh, and then I also have our first prize to give away. So our first prize is a $300 Amazon gift card. And again, you do need to be live and present here on today's webinar to win. And with that, uh, drum roll on your desk or your counter or your car dashboard, wherever you are today. And this one is going out to Kyle Howerton from Washington. Huge congrats to you, Kyle. And we'll be reaching out after today's webinar, letting you know how you can claim that prize as well. And with that, uh, let's keep things zipping along. Our next presenting team here, our friends at Rubrik. If you've been on some mega cats before, you may recognize the Rubrik team. Uh, but today we have got the amazing Seema Kathuria. Uh, she's the Senior Product Marketing Manager of Security at Rubrik. And uh, she's going to be talking to us here about uh, what they've been cooking up and what they have on the horizon. So Seema, I'm kicking this over to you. Take it away. Thank you. And I'm Seema Kathuria. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Rubrik. Today, I'll be sharing with you how you can simplify data security with automation. Here's the agenda. I'll talk about Rubrik, what the company does, what we're known for, and cyber resilience, the importance of cyber resilience as you think about your cybersecurity strategy. Rubrik's data context and that and how it can be used across your existing tools as well as from the Rubrik platform itself to provide very important visibility into data and data security postures. And finally, we're going to dive deeper into simplifying data security with automation, be it directly from Rubrik as well as other tools in your portfolio. So who is Rubrik and how can Rubrik help me? Maybe the best way to answer that question first is explaining what we don't do, what Rubrik doesn't do, which is prevention. We don't prevent anything. Yet you might ask, how can you be a security company if you're not preventing threats? Well, preventing threats is critical and we recognize that there are a lot of good companies who are doing this. And you probably know a lot of these yourselves. We're partnering with leaders in a variety of different security tools that focus on prevention. But when it comes to cybersecurity, there's a critical gap that continues to exist, protecting and securing the data that lives inside of different places, be it on-premises data centers, be it the cloud, be it SaaS applications. Ensuring your data is defensible at all times and that your business is cyber resilient is a really important consideration. Why is it really critical? Why is, import why is it important to think about cyber resilience? In particular, organizations can continue to be hit by things like ransomware as well as other cyber attacks. And it's not a failure of prevention firms. In fact, if anything, we should assume breaches will happen and they continue to happen and impact organizations across a variety of industries. You can see a number of them are the healthcare industry, it's often financial services, even government. The big attacks in the news are always focused on data and so when they get hit, these organizations are really worried about their data getting stolen. So the approach that Rubrik's taken is we believe that the focus of cybersecurity needs to expand. And that is where Rubrik comes in. We provide this particular value of delivering complete cyber resilience. This is because we focus on the data security itself. Rather than working outside in, as prevention security often does, we start with a focus on the data, the data within, and how we can take action on the data by having a lot of information and context around that data. What is cyber resilience? It's a combination of two really big important pillars. The first is data security posture management, and the second is cyber recovery, also known as enterprise data backup or protection. And Rubrik in particular has been around for 10 years, and we've been really well known for the enterprise data backup protection. We're one of the leaders there because we recognize that a number of firms continue to be hit by ransomware. So how could we help them stay resilient in the face of ransomware? More recently, you might've heard of data security posture management on the left side. And this is relatively a new area that is recognizing attacks will happen. And therefore, how can you have visibility into your data security posture to limit the data exposure and the risk of data exfiltration? So combined data security posture management or DSPM and cyber recovery can help you really achieve more comprehensive cyber resilience. And Rubrik Security Cloud is our platform that enables this cyber resilience. If you look at the Gartner, um, which is one of the big analysts in security, 
Gardner Magic Quadrant has given us the designation as leader. So Rubric's been a leader in the Magic Quadrant report for the past four years, in particular for our enterprise data backup and recovery capabilities. We provide immutable enterprise backup. It's the best in the industry. Immutable data backup essentially means that you have a copy of data that cannot be changed, deleted, or overwritten until a specific time has passed. Immutable data backups are protected, unchangeable, and encrypted. This will help ensure data is secure, be it a situation of a natural disaster, a human disaster, or initiated event, ransomware from any kind of malicious actors, as well as other cyber threats. You want to make sure your data is protected no matter what kind of event happens. And that's where immutable backups come in. You need to think of backup as a key part of your cybersecurity strategy and architecture. It's the ultimate insurance. And there are a number of things that Rubrik has innovated over the last you know, 10 years that we've been in this market to make sure that you feel like we can be a trusted vendor to make sure we're securing your data in a very strong immutable backup. With that data backup, it's a great place to get data context. Now that we know about your data, in, the, in this form, we can put that data into getting insight out of that data to work, to work for you. So in the remaining part of the session, we'll talk about how you're able to take a lot of these insights, knowing where your data is stored, where it's located. What kind of data do you have? Is it sensitive data? And if so, how can you classify that data? How can you make sure that only those who need access should have access at a specific time and, and place and where they should be revoked access? access? So there's, you know, there's this dynamic of, having access to data and whether that data access should change over time and it has it changed over time, all that visibility is available. We also have to understand how data can be changing in terms of location, maybe the way that it's being used in terms of compliance. So there are a number of variety of dynamic things that are happening that in some cases are in the organization's control and in other cases they have to comply with. Let's think about next then how we can actually leverage this data context to simplify data security using automation. Automation that can be available either natively through Rubrik or through your other tools that you may be using today that enable that automation and taking action on threats. And that's where we also come in because we can integrate with a number of those solutions. Let's first dive into data context from a recovery point of view. We talked about the fact that ransomware can happen and how can you recover more quickly and in a safe place with it. We will talk about the fact that Rubrik Cyber Recovery here allows you to surgically and rapidly recover applications, files, or objects while actually avoiding malware reinfection. Importantly, attackers are not only encrypting your data, oftentimes they're actually really trying to reinfect even your backup data. And that's where we come in by understanding that attacks are evolving from a one-time thing to even being multifaceted. So we can help you restore your business operations by going back to a safe recovery point with your data. And as your data set is evolving, as you have more data come in to your backup, we can actually go ahead and understand the changes in the data backup and just add more of that data backup over time and uh, saving you time and cost, really minimizing that um, need to go in manually and check for changes in that how much backup data at what point in time did you have to back up the new data. We can take care of that for you seamlessly. The other way to use our data context is to monitor for threats using rubric threat monitoring. It will automatically identify indicators of compromise, also known as IOCs, based on the latest threat intelligence. And this threat intelligence can be then fed into the rubric threat feed. There's two things, the hashes and the Yara rules are gonna come from different contributors. In one of the cases, the contributor is rubric's own information security team, which is wonderful because you get to leverage the same threat intel that we're using to protect our own selves when we're looking at our own data. And the other intel can also come from our rubric zero labs, which is shown on the left. This is our own internal threat research team that is continuously monitoring for what is happening with different sensitive data across different sets of data um, for you know, our, own, our own company as well as other companies that we're protecting. We can also get data from third parties. Maybe you have certain threat intel sources that you wanna be able to consume. You can tell us about them and we can also work with our own partners to leverage threat intelligence. We will also make sure no matter where that threat intelligence comes for, from open source, third party, our own teams, we're gonna vet it to make sure that the quality of the intelligence is very high. We wanna also make sure that threat intelligence is relevant, that the threats are relevant to the critical infrastructure environments we're helping to protect. Once that threat intelligence has been vetted, it's downloaded by threat monitoring at a set time interval. And as new threat intel comes in, a threat hunt can get kicked off automatically and go out and search for specific threats based on the hashes and Yara rules. And that's really important. You wanna make sure that you are continuously looking for any match and notified 
either by email or checking your own um, rubrics data threat analytics dashboard for the latest threat intel. You can also drill down via our dashboard to see where that threat was located, what hash or Yara rule had been matched, and find attributes associated with the hash or Yara for more background information. This could assist you in potentially kicking off other threat hunts through our rubric threat hunting feature, or via third-party tools like SIMs or EDRs. You could even quarantine the threat from within threat monitoring. So that's another big benefit is actually trying to isolate that particular threat until you can go ahead and contain it. Essentially, threat monitoring is a turnkey solution that will help you detect and protect the organization from threats. The intelligence is automatically downloaded. The threat hunts based off this threat intelligence are also automatic. And if threats are found, you're notified about them. And any attributes associated to the threat can be shared whenever possible making it really a simple solution. Next, consider having data context for detection of anomalous behavior to determine the scope of a cyber attack. This is where rubric anomaly detection comes in. It's a comprehensive approach to ransomware remediation. So imagine a situation that you have a ransomware attack. How are you going to remediate quickly? Rubric can help. Rubric anomaly detection uses multi-stage machine learning to detect anomalies on your backup data. These stages include observing file creations, deletions, and modifications, and comparing those things to historical changes within the specific workload to understand what changed and what happened. So you can then start doing more detective investigative work. Also, entropy is analyzed to determine if any ransomware-like encryption had taken place. That's definitely a big indicator of some suspicious action and event that happened. And finally, if it is possible, we could even identify the specific ransomware strain, giving you even more insight when you go back and do your investigation to be able to see what kind of action can be taken, what point in time to investigate that particular ransomware type. If an attack has already occurred, Rubric automates the assessment of the blast radius to understand quickly what applications and files were impacted and when they were impacted, importantly, in a point in time. This eliminates the intensive manual labor that's required like bringing up a virtual machine copy, manually comparing and scrubbing for changes, which could take weeks, if not months also in some cases. Anomaly detection can help. It gets really granular down to the folder and file level so you know exactly what was impacted and could have to be recovered from your backups. And unlike other solutions in the market, Rubrik can even detect encryption of VMs, such as the popular VMware ESXi hypervisor. And this is really important because malicious actors are increasingly targeting virtualization infrastructure today. And these attacks could take down systems that are running on virtual infrastructure, including even security tools that run on virtual infrastructure. So it's really important to have this visibility and ability to detect these kinds of things where your VMs in, in particular become vulnerable to attack and encryption. And because your data is not available in read or write mode, it cannot be overwritten. This refers to our file system immutability. One-click recoveries can be leveraged to revert back to the most clean recent version, whether using instant recovery, live mount, or even file level recovery operations. You can rest assured that you can recover back to a clean safe point as quickly as possible. Another use case for data context is being able to use data context to automatically discover and classify your sensitive data. This is the part of when we lean into the data security posture management piece, we start thinking about how can I discover my sensitive data? How do I know what kind of sensitive data I have? We can automate that for you. We can locate and discover that data across on-premises data centers, cloud and SaaS environments. This means that you don't have to really put any manual efforts into understanding what where the sensitive data is and then where you can go ahead and find that data and then take some action on it. We can provide visibility into known as well as unknown shadow data in the cloud scanning your environment even without any intervention from the team, so making it really simple and easy. You can really focus that way on what's important to your business. We can even scan new data assets as they are brought on board into those environments. We can even exist find changes to existing data assets and then make sure that they've been labeled properly. And one of the more recent innovations is we're integrating with the Microsoft Information Protection labeling so that we'll be able to do even more enrichment of that labeling mechanism, so really enriching some of your existing DLP and MIP solutions. In addition to data discovery and classification, you also have to think about what else you need to look at for when you're looking at the data security posture itself to reduce the risk of data theft upfront, or hopefully ahead of an attack. For one, 
We will help you eliminate unnecessary data. Think about redundant data, stale data you no longer need as a business. It's completely something that you can forego. You don't need it anymore. If you can do that, that's going to help you reduce your attack surface. So by locating that for you, you can actually take an action on that data and reduce your overall footprint. You could even lower your cloud spend on data backup because you're no longer going to save any of this extra data that's no longer needed in your cloud. Now you can focus your security efforts on just the data that you care about. The second benefit is we'll help you limit access to sensitive data by identifying your most risky users. In some cases, it's, these could be your C-level leadership uh, folks that might have access to some, you know, uh, that undisclosed information of the companies, maybe in forthcoming press release. It could be data that is of your own personal users. It could be PII data. You want to understand who are the most risky users and what kind of sensitive data they have in the organization based on how they're accessing that data. Are they touching data they shouldn't be? You can use this information to proactively implement least privileged access, which is a very critical way for you to reduce the data exposure. And third, we will continuously assess data posture, identifying and enabling you to remediate data security violations that put your sensitive data at risk of exposure and exfiltration, because it's not a one-time thing. Data is not gonna stay still. Users won't stay still. You wanna continuously be monitoring for any new and upcoming risks to the data. And finally, we'll monitor and alert you to anomalous and suspicious data access and activity as soon as possible. That way you can quickly contain security incidents and minimize the financial, business, and regulatory impact it could have on your organization. One of the more recent capabilities we've also added from an action standpoint is being able to take action on key insights that we've gleaned within our rubric cloud on users, their activity on sensitive data and permissions. Say you have an IT service team that you want to go ahead and take some action on this insight that data that rubric is providing on user access to data. We can actually go ahead and enable that through our new integration with ServiceNow ticketing system. The first step of this is being able to have rubric identify any new instance of data accessed by a specific identity or user. The second is the rubric admin will go in to the rubric security cloud UI and file a ticket. And they're, they're kicking off that ticket process for ServiceNow. And then within the last stages are the third and final steps to manage and track those tickets across time for the status and follow up on the corrective action you want to take against that particular identity. Maybe you want to revoke access at this time for that particular data set from that identity. Well, that, with this IT service ticket management system, you'll be able to take that action. So we're really happy that this is something that our customers of service now can start taking advantage of. And when you look at the final piece, which I mentioned earlier, is we recognize our customers are using a lot of different security tools already, and we can help them make them even more powerful. With information rubric has to understand organizations' data, knowing that what's happening on the production data and what we're backing up from that production system, we can get give you that better context to existing security tools to make security teams more aware and efficient. For one, rubric will provide information about your sensitive data to your data loss prevention tools, for example, to prevent data exfiltration. Say that certain data set um, think of the analogy of having all your diamonds in a certain safe and locker, but you have less valuable jewelry in another locker. Well, we can distinguish between the most sensitive data and less sensitive data and nuance that and give you that kind of granularity of data context so you can take the appropriate action with your DLP tools. Another level of, in, of context is we will provide user intelligence for your identity and access management or IAM tools also to that infrastructure. This is to help detect compromised accounts. Maybe there's an account that is all of a sudden uh, having a behavior where they shouldn't be touching certain kind of sensitive data. And we realize that, that that there's this kind of behavior that's happening that does not indicate that this user is behaving in the way they should. We are suspecting it's a compromised account. We can send that kind of context over the, the IAM tool to then take an action, maybe resetting that person's password or other credentials in order for them to get back in business and uh, not, not go through that whole compromise situation anymore. We can provide a number of SOAR and SIM tools with a context in terms of logs, messages, automated playbooks, which will help the security operations teams reduce manual tasks. It's really going to enable them because they have this rich data context that they can leverage within those existing threat logs. Rubric can provide data to your other solutions near network security, cloud security, as well as other zero trust or ZTNA solutions to better protect your data. We are uniquely in a position with the backups that we have to provide this rich context to those solutions. And finally, if you today have endpoint detection response, XDR solutions and tools, we will help you by providing that context to help triage and reduce the mean time to response by, again, working alongside with that tool and providing um, that data context to them. 
And if you want to know what vendors we work with, we're more than welcome to look at our website. We started working with a number of vendors, including CrowdStrike, um, having integration with them. It's really important to put this context directly into your existing security tools. Why? Because then you're combining the target, which is the data context, with the threat context that you have into a single place, a place that your security practitioners are using every day. And this helps with detecting, prioritizing, and responding ultimately um, to those threats to better secure your data as much as possible to help with that cyber resilience. And of course, um, last but not least, I wanted to talk to you about how we can really enrich how and make and make life easier for um, your the, the backup admin for the security admin by offering this generative AI companion that we call Ruby from Rubric. After we make data context easy to consume, understanding and acting on it through this Ruby powerful tool will enable customers to quickly perform the most complex tasks. It's a very new capability um, that we've really invested in because we recognize that organizations are looking for strong cyber resilience and they want more and more help where they don't have enough people that they can necessarily find nor afford. So it's important to be able to use this assistive technology to really enable this. A large part of the strong cyber resilience is about rapid recovery from cyber attacks. So that is the first use case. Um, so Rubrik will help you do that by working within the same security cloud from Rubrik UI. And the skills will be helping you through a specific workflow while providing all the necessary context right at your fingertips. It will help you guide and help the customers through the recovery process after a cyber tech happens. And it's built on Microsoft Azure's OpenAI technology and been trained on our own Rubrik's internal knowledge and expertise. So you don't need to train it as a customer. It's not going to use any customer data. So there's not that privacy concern. Um, and But what I'm sharing with you today is the first use case of Ruby. And there'll be more to come as we equip Ruby with more skills over time in addition to this post-attack recovery as a practical, ever-evolving solution to help you strengthen your cyber resilience. So I encourage you to learn more about Ruby, again, on our website, www.rubric.com. So as I move towards our summary to offer today, um, we again, we're a company that is all about protecting uh, data at its very core. And in the Rubric Security Cloud, it's enabling you to achieve very high cyber resilience through a combination of strong data security posture management and our market leading cyber recovery solution so that you have a single place to go, the Rubric Security Cloud, to be able to manage that data over time, understand how the data security posture is changing over time, which users are, are accessing that sensitive data, and then being able to use all of that great con data context in your existing tools as well as with the Rubric. And if you're thinking, well, why is why is cyber resilience as important as, or if not, um, you know, more is in terms of preventing threats? I'm already preventing threats with a lot of the tools I have. Is that not enough? Well, the reality is successful attacks can happen. And in that case, you want to minimize the damage, absorb the hit, and recover quickly. These are three big outcomes. Now, with Rubric, you will know what you're protecting. You'll know what data you have. You can reduce your data exposure and your data theft risk with DSPM. You can monitor the data directly for threats through a number of the capabilities like threat monitoring that we talked about, being able to threat hunt on specific indicators of compromise and be in a much more proactive state. And we've also shared that data context with other security tools. So that just helps you enrich data context with threat context to take even greater action in your existing tools. Overall, all in all, now you'll be able to achieve cyber resilience. You'll be prepared in case an attack does happen. So if I leave you with cyber resilience is being able to successfully endure cyber attacks rather than solely trying to prevent them. So think about racing atop a mountain bike. You could get hurt. And in that case, the key is what kind of protective gear you have, what you have on. And if and when you crash, can you just dust off and continue the race? Well, that's the goal. Cyber resilience is to be prepared for the attack so it doesn't take you out of the race. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Seema. That was awesome. Uh, I love that analogy of the mountain bike and not getting taken out of the race. Um, and I just like that approach that Rubric has in general that, hey, these things will happen. Yes, you're going to want to prevent them. But how resilient are you and how quick are you to be able to make these hits essentially a non-issue? So. Super cool. Uh, again, we've got the the poll up today, what additional information you would like about the rubric solution. So if you are looking for anything in regards to that data sheets, demos, pricing, etc. Uh, again, this is your easiest way to get exactly what you're looking for and rubric will follow up. 
Uh, again, for anyone who asked a question, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are kind of at time here with SEMA, so we're not going to be able to do a Q&A together. Um, but don't worry, all of your questions will be answered and we'll have some follow-ups for you as well. So do keep those coming in. Uh, there is a link in the handouts tab there for rubric zero labs so if you are looking to learn more you can measure your data's risk and how you can apply rubrics automated protection technology to what you're up to in your organization and uh, of course ruby is a really cool um, tool that you might want to check out up and beyond that with that, I've got a couple more prizes to give away. So we have got uh, both a $300 Amazon gift card as well as an iPad Pro here to give away. Again, you do need to be live and present here today's Megacast to win. So wishing you all luck. And without further ado, the gift card to Amazon for $300 is going out to Chris Austin from Tem Tennessee. And the iPad Pro is going out to Michael Medeiros from California. Big congrats to you both, uh, Michael and Chris, and we'll be reaching out after the webinar to let you know how you can win, or well, rather, you already won, but how you can redeem those prizes. So uh, with that, let's keep things moving along. We have got the team from Cohesity in the queue. Super excited to have Cohesity back. Uh, I think it was maybe a couple months ago, not even. Uh, we had Shelly Calhoun-Jones here uh, talk to us about some of the awesome things going on at Cohesity in an AI summit. And today we are going to explore deeper into that. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Shelly. Shelly is the principal technologist, uh, technology advocacy group, and she's working with Cohesity. And then also for the live Q&A, I have Mark Mamborquet, who is going to be joining us. He's the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Cohesity. So uh, welcome Shelly first, and then Mark will be joining also for the Q&A. So again, keep those questions coming in. You might be lucky enough if you've got a great question to win one of those $50 Best Question gift cards that are going out for each session. And with that, I'm going to kick things over to you, Shelly. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, real excited to be here today. Uh, in this session, we're going to take a look at the brand new uh, Cohesity Gaia, which is an AI-powered conversational assistant. And this is part of a larger end-to-end uh, -end platform that Cohesity offers, which drives AI-powered data security and management. The idea is that we want to simplify how businesses are protecting, storing, and managing their data. And we can do this using artificial intelligence to ensure that our business operations are smarter and secure. And you can see that we have this broken down into five unique pillars, starting with data protection. The idea is that for most organizations, you can back up workloads that are spread across multiple clouds, different on-prem environments. Let's imagine that your company just went through a major merger and acquisition. So you have data that is sprinkled all over the world. Um, so the idea is that we want to give you the ability to not only back up your data, but also make sure that you're meeting your compliance goals. And if you do need to perform a recovery, you can do so uh, within a matter of minutes. And from a data security perspective, uh, we offer cyber vaulting as a service. This is a complete data isolation solution that allows you to keep an unalterable copy of your data until you need it. We also have two other critical features, threat scanning and data classification. This gives you the ability to scan your backup data to ensure that you, you're not dealing with any new threats. Um, and if you do have sensitive data that is maybe in a particular workload, gives you the ability to tighten down your security policies and you also get that automation piece uh, with our SOC integrations. There's a couple other pillars here I wanna quickly touch on, but I do want to note that we are going to be mostly focused on data insights in this session, but data insights builds upon these other pillars. For example, with data mobility, you have the ability to perform DR orchestration. You have the ability to quickly migrate your data into the cloud. And with data access, this gives you the ability to centralize uh, your files and objects to ensure that if you do need to you know, improve your access efficiency, uh, you can reduce any redundant copies of data that you have, and you can also stand up uh, test and development environments without affecting production. So that's really helpful from a development perspective. But for this session, we're going to focus on data insights, 
in particular, why big data is so crucial, because this is a powerful tool that a lot of organizations use to gather and analyze vast amounts of information. You know, just a moment ago, I was talking about how for a lot of companies out there, they're managing data across multiple clouds, uh, multiple on-prem environments. Uh, you could be working for a large financial institution where you have branches that are all over the country, or maybe you work for a company where you have branches that are spread all over the world. And so this gives you the ability to understand uh, you know, the type of business intelligence that's coming into your environment. It also helps driving uh, organizations to make better decisions, predict future outcomes, have the ability to understand what this information is and how you can make your company more efficient. So it's a lot of cat herding involved, but from a cohesity perspective, we have the ability to not only you know bring that information closer to you, um, but we also rely on a distributed architecture, which I'll touch on here in just a moment. Now, you'll notice here, something here on the slide that says, bring compute to the data. Now, what does that mean? Well, the idea is that instead of shipping data to compute platforms where your applications can act on it, why don't we leave that data in place and bring the application services to the data? And so, you know, for a lot of organizations out there, you are not only working uh, with workloads that could be on-prem, you could be working with stateless workloads that could be running off of containers or even serverless uh, if you're working within the cloud. And so that's something that we've seen over the last 10 years is that compute has become ephemeral. The idea is that you are working with stateless workloads. You're not always gonna have the same data there. You may be scaling in and scaling out to be more elastic. So that's the that's a transformation that we've seen over the last decade. And with big data, it's even more important that you're not trying to gather this information off of your production data. So we are basically taking that data in place and we're quantifying the data that we're backing up. And Cohesity uses uh, this distributed architecture approach. It basically ensures that you have scalability, reliability, efficiency within your data management. And so that means that you can handle large amounts of data across different loads, different locations, while you're able to handle that performance and reliability. Now, when we say API rich extensibility, what that means is that you can integrate into our APIs with your own in-house tools, or you can take advantage of our many different API integrations, which you can leverage within our data security alliance. And you also have responsible access to the data, which means that the platform enables users to secure their access. So you can set different levels of permissions while making sure that you're meeting your compliance, privacy, and security goals. So Cohesity Gaia is one of the first offerings to offer retrieval augmented generation AI on secondary data. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and what that means is that we have the ability to quantify the data that you're backing up using a conversational interface uh, using AI-powered search retrieval and summarization, and it also has the ability to generate large language model-based responses, which you can see here in this example. So we have a Cohesity user that's wanting to find out uh, whether or not we have patient names and treatment plans in our corporate systems that were, could have potentially been exposed within the last 120 days. It's a pretty important question to ask, right? And so what we can see here is that Gaia returned back a response with potential patient names and treatment plans. And not only that, but it's also giving us those citations. And so this is just one example. I'm going to be jumping into a demo here in just a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other features that Gaia offers. So the idea with Gaia is that this is SaaS based which means that you don't have to worry about setting up an appliance within a data center or deploying it to a server. This is something that you can set up and deploy within a matter of minutes. And it uses a SaaS-based connection to do it. It integrates in with Cohesity's backup as a service. And you can create a dedicated data pool uh, from, with, from your own backups. So for example, you may have a uh, compliance team 
that needs to go in and do some information gathering on a particular issue or maybe an audit just occurred, they can create a data set uh, from those backups and ask Gaia questions. Uh, you'll also notice that it has uh, natural lang language queries, which means that you don't have to create these vast SQL queries or statements. You can just ask it using a natural language. Um, it's AI powered, it uses retrieval augmented generation, and it has a multi-turn chat interface. So you can always go back and look at the history if you've asked Gaia previous questions and you want to uh, look at previous results, it gives you the ability to do that. Some other benefits uh, that Cohesity offers is the, the AI powered search. You have the ability to perform conversational search on your backup data. Uh, the search is relatively quick. Um, you typically, it, it'll take maybe a couple of minutes at most to complete the query. So you'll get quick results, a quick response. Uh, you don't have to worry about having extra copies of your backup data. It will query the, the data in place. Uh, you can also see where the answers were fetched if you need citations or if you need to go and recover a particular document uh, with more information of the topic that you're looking for. Uh, it's context aware. So it, it performs a semantic search and it does not search the internet for answers. It is strictly focused on your backup data. So it gives you the ability to converse with your backups using natural language queries. Um, it generates high quality results, which we'll see here in just a moment. And there's no model training, meaning that you don't have to tra train a large language model with your data. It's pre-built out of the box so that when you deploy, you can start asking Gaia questions. So the idea behind Gaia is that it can conduct searches on your data and deliver results. And those results can actually be augmented to provide summaries or other insights from your data. So for example, if you get a really long response and you want to summarize that response, you can refine the question and ask Gaia a more focused question so that it can summarize the information that it finds. So it gives you the ability to do this without creating complicated search equations. Instead, you can just ask additional questions to augment the findings and gain deeper insight. Now, there are many different use cases for Cohesity Gaia, but this slide lists a few. Um, if, we, if we look at e-discovery, you know, the idea behind this is if you need to find information electronically, you know, for legal purposes, maybe you're looking through email messages, uh, maybe you're gathering digital evidence, you can leverage uh, the e-discovery with Gaia. Uh, you could also perform an enterprise search. Maybe you were looking for information across different data sources. Maybe we were looking for information across emails, internal uh, SharePoint sites, databases. Uh, it gives you the ability to leverage it like a search engine. But instead of using the internet, you would be searching your own company's sources. Another great example would be IT support. Let's imagine that we're on an IT support team and we're troubleshooting problems and we're providing advice to our internal users. So it can help with troubleshooting. It can help with retrieving information from your company's knowledge base. It can provide guided assistance for your users. Also helps from a learning and training perspective because you can use Gaia to provide personalized, interactive, or even on-demand assistance. So if you're not clear on a particular concept, you could ask a question for clarification or even get instant Q&A support. So these just list some of the other examples of how you can use Gaia. Uh, my team is in the process of creating videos for the Cohesity YouTube channel. So if you wanna see more demos or more use cases, stay tuned for that. We'll have that out um, on our YouTube channel here over the next couple of weeks. All right, and then just a couple more uh, use cases here. Uh, so we can see that you can also use it for legal discovery. We kind of mentioned that here on the previous slide, but I just want to quickly call these out because I think they're really, really cool. You know, the fact that you can use it from a compliance perspective, maybe you're trying to identify potential compliance risks. Uh, these are videos that we already have out on our website. I do recommend checking them out. I'm going to be jumping into a demo here in just a moment, but I also want to briefly mention that we're going to be adding a new feature to Gaia, uh, Cohesity Gaia Data Explorer. 
And what this does is it quantifies the data uh, within your data set and it'll actually provide suggested questions based off the topics that it finds. So in this example, we can see that we're drilling in on corporate finance analysis and we want to learn what the sales pipeline was in the last quarter. And so if we pop that question into Gaia, it's going to generate a response showing that we received 120 deals. We have a pipeline value of 35 million and it's also showing us the success rate. So a lot of different ways that you can use Gaia. This is just one example. I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to another screen here. All right, so we are, we are currently in Cohesity Data Cloud. You can see that we have this broken down into five unique pillars uh, from protection to security, mobility, access, and insights. Now for this demonstration, we're gonna focus on the insights view and you'll see that we actually have two subcategories here. We have our data insights solution. We also have another product called platform insights. We're gonna focus on data insights. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into Gaia. This will take just a moment here. And we're going to kick things off with a scenario. So let's imagine that we work for a company and we're part of a legal team and we're, we're going in and we're doing an audit. It's never a fun thing to hear. Oof, audit, right? Um, so what I can do is I can go in and I can choose my data set. Now, in this example, we are going to go ahead and pick our company here. But before I actually ask a question, if you want to add additional data sets, you'll notice that over here we have a settings view. And what this means is that we can create different data sets based off of our backup data for different applications. We can also create additional data sets up here at the top. So let's go ahead and return back to the chat view and I'm gonna choose my data set. And we're gonna ask our first question. Okay, so right now we're just trying to find out how many cases that we've seen at this company over the last decade. Now, this is gonna take a moment or two because what it's doing right now is it's parsing our backup data and looking for any potential correlation right now. And it does this using um, OpenAI. So that's what we're using on the back end. We're using OpenAI. Uh, you'll also notice down here at the bottom we have the ability to choose the large language model that we want to use. In this example, we're using the Cohesity Advanced Large Language Model. And now we're getting back a response. And so looks like from what, what, what Gaia has found is that uh, DigiCorp has been involved in multiple legal cases over the last decade. Um, it's giving us some additional uh, case references here. We can see that it was related to um, labor law. And what I like about this is it's actually generating the response back in real time. And it's giving us a summary of based off of what it found. So we can see that we had some state law based tort cl claims. Uh, it looks like we were seen uh, within the federal courts. It's giving us some additional statistics here. And in just a moment, once it completes generating the response, we'll actually get some citations, which is really cool. So you'll actually have the ability to go and download the documents that it found this information within. And so we can see that we had 2,061 paid cases. We had some additional numbers here, and then we have our source references. So if I wanted to, I could go and download these source references if I wanted to learn more. But just imagine like if you had to go and do this manually, it, it could take days, if not weeks, to go and canvas information you know, for this type of data. So really interesting that you have the ability to do this just using a conversational type interface. Now let's drill down a little bit further. Let's find out what types of cases actually were in active lit litigation. Okay, so it's gonna start generating the answers. While it's running, I do wanna also call out that you do have the ability to like or say a particular response is off target. 
uh, what this will do. So it'll give that feedback to Gaia just to make sure that it's generating on target responses. You can also you know, gather more information. You can even go out uh, to this link here, Mastering the Art of Asking Questions, if you want to learn more about creating your own questions uh, for Gaia. But right now, it's drilling down even further in the data set, uh, looking for information so we can get more information on cases that remain in active litigation. So I'll go ahead and click like for right now. <laughs> Just tell Gaia that it was a good response. And then it uh, looks like we did, we did receive back a response here. And it looks like it's actually breaking it down into uh, different categories. So we have cases of industry-wide significance. Uh, we have issues with the same taxpayer. We have some cases with insufficient information and some additional issues that it found. Looks like some of these uh, cases were pretty visible uh, to the public here. Oh my goodness. All right. So it looks like we did have some, some legal issues uh, with some of the cases that were uh, within active litigation. Let's go ahead and find out more information here. Oop. So this is an interesting one. Let's find out if there are cases where we had individuals that filed that could not afford the court fees. So I'm going to go ahead and pop that in there. And just as you can see with this previous question, uh, we did have some source references here where I could actually go and maybe even download the PDF. It'll kind of give you a preview snippet of what's in the document if you want to find out more information. But essentially what you can do here is if you want to you know, do a recovery of that document, you can actually download uh, the corresponding document or file uh, from, the, from the response, which is great. Okay, so it looks like there were some cases where individuals could not afford the, the court fees. So it's just pro providing us a response, an ex explanation for the reason why, and... It's also giving us some additional information uh, related to federal law, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so I'm just going to ask it one more question here and then we'll wrap up the demo. We're just basically going to summarize uh, basically the information that we found based off the legal court cases. Okay, and so while it's generating those answers, um, I, I do want to mention if you want to learn more about Gaia, we do have a, a landing page on Cohesity.com. Um, you also have the ability to go out to my.cohesity.com. We have uh, videos, we have a knowledge base out there and information that can help get you started. And we'll also be providing a, a data sheet uh, with this session if you want to learn more or maybe even sign up for a trial. Okay, so that pretty much completes the demonstration. You can see that what we did here was I, I picked a topic, we, we did some research, we were able to augment our findings by just drilling down and really uh, you know, getting more information on legal cases for our company here. In addition, it's giving us some additional feedback on, on what it's found related to the uh, legal court cases that we have within our system. So you can see how it really expedites the search of going in and doing an audit versus having to go in and do this manually. So um, I want to go ahead and thank, thank the folks here for uh, letting me uh, join you guys today uh, for this session. And if you have any questions, we'll be sticking around after this session. If you have any, if you want to get more information, um, if there are any questions from the content that we covered, but thanks again for uh, having me and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much, Shelley. Sorry, everyone. My mic was not unmuted yet. <laughs> uh, that was great. Honestly, I love looking at Gaia under the hood. And I'm just astounded by how much you guys can do already with this product. So 
Super, super cool. Um, we have a special poll here. So the poll's asking, uh, would you like to meet with your Kohi City sales representative to know more about our solutions? Check all that apply. So you've got a couple things there if you're interested in natural language, Gen AI, with Kohi City Gaia, modern backup and recovery with Data Protect, cyber vaulting and recovery with Fort Knox, super awesome name, threat protection and data classification with DataHawk, protecting your M365 data with Bass, or not at this time. Uh, with that, we've got a lot of questions and we've got Mark here waiting in the wings. So Mark, I'm going to bring you on out. Are you ready to field a few questions from the audience here? Sure. Lay it on me. All right. Excellent. Okay. So question number one that I've got in the queue, this is from uh, Paul. He's wondering, what are some examples of real world challenges that Cohesity Gaia helps address? Uh, that's an interesting one. So uh coicity gaia is focusing in on on really the enterprise search and and retrieval kind of function right and and so you know in our surveys we find out that like the typical worker office worker is really spending about 30 percent of their their time looking searching finding documents so they can go and, and do their job that 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 finding and searching function is is really time consuming uh, so what we find is that Coicity Gaia really, uh, you know, applies to any of us that are, uh, you know, going through documents, trying to find uh, histories and, and, and what have you, um, you know, from a more specific kind of vertical, uh, anyone who has to do like legal discoveries or compliance checks, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really extremely valuable. Uh, healthcare is a great one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to physical therapy for my back, and uh, I talk about how uh, Gaia could help out my uh, the the GM at the physical therapist on figuring out how many uh, uh, patients come in with back procedures that need to be done, and, and what's the average length of of, of the time that they spend. Uh, in physical therapy and and maybe even going into you know some of the billing practices, all of that information lives in our our data that we back up. So what we're doing with with Gaia is really uh, utilizing those backups in a very non-destructive way, and and being uh, adding that Gen AI uh, engine to to be able to extract the knowledge that's hidden in that data. That's awesome. I. I'm just so excited about this tool. <laughs> uh, I have a follow-up question. You were mentioning this about, say, like a healthcare practitioner, uh, but one of the questions here from the audience was about different use cases. Can you give a few more use cases that uh, you know Gaia could be used for? Yeah, I mean, one of the ones that we see, uh, I'll use legal because that's a that's another one, right? You know, you have an employee who uh, leaves the company um, and and goes to a competitor. Um, did they take any documents with them? Did they share that stuff out? So the way that you would have to do that manually would be creating these these uh, boolean expressions and and go in and and search through you know emails and and data logs and uh, different pieces of, of of data that lives within your network. Um, what we're able to do now, and our, our legal team uh, internally uses it, is that they basically kind of point it at the, uh, at the repository of the backed up data, and then they go in and they can actually use uh, natural language questions. So instead of creating a Boolean expression that goes on for 10 or 15 pages, uh, we're able to go in and do ask a simple question using you know, common language, uh, and then it's semantically able to go out and find that data. So when it goes out and finds that data, it's actually also going to create uh, a summary of, of its findings. And what we've done uh, on top of that is actually made it possible to uh, recite where that data came from. So you can judge for yourself whether or not the, the answer is accurate and then be able to actually retrieve that data. Uh, so if you did find a an email that needed more investigation, it's going to pull it up and you'd be able to, to retrieve it right then and there. That's incredible. Awesome. Um, 
yeah, I just think people are going to be able to like supercharge their own data databases now. This sense that, you know, we all as companies and organizations tend to collect a lot of data, but we don't always know where it lives and how to really take what we need out of it until we're like, oh, we need this audit or we have this thing. But um, or, or even when you come on to a new project, uh, I came on uh, last year and, and there was a host of things that were done before I got there. What's the easiest way of, of getting that brain dump? Well, I took all the uh, the notes from the, the team meetings, uh, dumped it into Gaia, and it created a, a one-page summary with, with uh, annotations. Wow. I that's mean, that's really and, and that was five minutes versus trying to find, <laughs> you know, all these notes that, that uh, may be, you know, scattered across your enterprise. Awesome. Um, okay, I have a question here about the large language models that uh, Cohesity Gaia uses. Uh, can you mm -hmm. shed some light on that? So right now we use uh, OpenAI, AI um, um, and in the future, uh, in the near future, you'll be able to bring your own. Uh, so what does that mean? So right now we're, we're using uh, uh, the OpenAI uh, chat GPT 4.0 and, and some others. Uh, in the future, if you had a let's pick a you know uh, a legal um, a legal use case, if you wanted to bring in a legal an LLM that was focusing on legal um, language and, and and things of that nature, the industry, uh, you could bring that in, right? So so the beginning is is right now with with OpenAI. Uh, in the future, you'll be able to bring your own specialized or even switch over to maybe some competing ones. To see, you know, what the differences are in, uh, in, in your, in, re, in your responses. That's awesome. I, I would love to keep picking your brain all day, but we are pushing up against time here. So I'm going to throw on one more poll for everyone out in the audience. There, um, just looking at any additional information you'd like from Cohesity, uh, other than those specific products cited in the first poll. Uh, and then, Mark, any kind of final call to action or thing you want to leave the audience with here as we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, we have a, a ton of information on, on Coicity.com. Um, but, you know, I really I think the, the, the real selling value of, of Coicity is trying it out. And we do have a, a full free trial uh, that's available through the website. You just have to fill out a form. Someone will contact you and. Uh, get you set up, but you know, I think using it is the real uh, test, uh, tried test, uh, true test to uh, testament to the product's value. Uh, once you start using it, it, it's got a real stickiness to it. I love that. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you and uh, Shelly's time and look forward to learning more about this as, as things progress. Hope to have you back soon. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Take care. All righty, everyone. So again, that poll is up there for you. The handouts tab there is for you. So if you are looking to uh, to do a demo, you can go to cohesity.com and check out their website. Uh, but you can also get the solution overview in PDF format. It's just an easy two pager there covering Cohesity Gaia AI powered data insights. You got key benefits, use cases a link to take on that demo if you want right in the PDF document as well. It's also time to give away a couple more prizes. So we've got our third $300 Amazon gift card here and the second iPad Pro to give away. Once again, you do need to be live and present here at the Megacast to win. And so I'm hoping you hear your name called out now. First and foremost, for that $300 Amazon gift card, I have Mary Therlong from North Carolina. Congratulations, Mary. And we have Adam Hemphill from South Carolina winning the second iPad Pro. And as always, we'll be reaching out after the Megacast today to let you know how you can redeem those prizes. And again, if you're feeling lucky and you've been asking questions, thank you guys all for being so inquisitive, so interactive today. You might be lucky enough to win one of those $50 Best Question gift cards. And with that, uh, we are going to move to our fourth and final team here presenting on today's Megacast. And we've got uh, not one, but two speakers here joining us from Pure Storage. So we have Kevin Rickson, who is the Director of Product Marketing at Pure Storage, as well as Mike Nelson, who is their Technical 
Evangelist. Awesome title. I love that one. And uh, Kevin and Mike, I'm going to hand this over to you. I love this kind of conversational back and forth uh, approach to presenting. So uh, take it away, you two. Hi, welcome. My name is Kevin Rickson. I'm here with Pure Storage, and I'm also joined by Mike Nelson, my colleague over here at uh, Pure Storage. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to be talking today about data at your service, basically how to simplify storage so that IT itself can get more bang for buck and uh, be more efficient and gain agility, especially when it comes to managing data and managing your storage. Um, and so let's just launch right into it. I want to give you all just a little bit of context for why this is important, because I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, look, isn't data management at the heart of data storage anyway? And can't all products do that? Um, well, the thing is, things are changing very, very rapidly right now. And what we're in is the same type of inflection that we saw back when virtualization hit the scene. And we went from bare metal server and direct attached storage and all that kind of stuff to being able to, you know, on the fly almost, manage which applications we're going to get what resources within the IT stack. And AI is a pressure that's helping create this transformation right now. But there are other things too, data security, um, all sorts of other things. And what we're seeing is that applications and especially how we use data is changing so rapidly that what's needed is a new way of thinking about storage. And I think this is really, it comes into sharp relief when we start looking at the day-to-day -day management of that storage. The complexity that exists in current legacy storage just can't make the transition in this new transformation that we're seeing. Um, you know, we're not really sure exactly where AI is going at this point, but we know it's gonna take a big effort and a big lift. And at the heart of AI is data. And it's not just the matter of collecting it all so that it can be used within, for instance, uh, you know, generative AI, gen AI workloads, um, but it's also producing vast amounts of data. And we're never quite sure exactly what direction we're gonna go in. Most people are just in the AI pilot stages right now of figuring out how they're gonna harness it. And so therefore they haven't even necessarily gotten to how is this going to affect the rest of my infrastructure stack, especially around storage. But you know, we've actually gone out and done some um, surveying with a uh, credible third party that let us know that 54% of IT budget is going to be spent on AI efforts in the next few years. And paired with this is this whole movement, just like we saw in software 10 or so years ago, another inflection point where everything is really moving toward as a service. It's not just about buy it, sweat the asset, manage it yourself. You know, why can't things run more like they do on the public cloud and the way things are available from hyperscalers? Uh, so 50% um, of the respondents in this survey said that they're now adopting a services first approach, both in how they work with their own constituencies and their organizations, as well as what they're looking for from vendors. You know, how can you provide my infrastructure to me as a service? So that, again, I have more of that agility and I'm not locked in on decisions I made two or three years ago when the world was a very different place. So what is holding us back from getting that agility now with the current state of IT and especially around storage? Well, when you think about it, you know, most storage stacks were built for that old model. Um, they, they really just kind of evolved out of not just the hard disk world, but really that direct attached storage world, even storage appliances to a large degree. Because if nothing else, they were defined by the workload that they were supposed to do. Hey, this thing uh, would be really well suited for block storage, and it's just this one application, so let's go ahead and get a solution for that. And then over here, let's get something that's going to have rich you know, data formats and file and object and different things, but that's going to be its own separate stack over here. Uh, each of them with their own management plane and complexity involved, uh, different types of technology, even if you're getting them from the same vendor, oftentimes they're run as completely separate stacks. 
Um, there's constant data migration that's involved, repurchasing of storage, just levels and levels of complexity. And what's needed is a way to just simplify all this stuff down and start looking at, you know, how can we get an actual unified data platform that manages all my data that, you know, first of all, hopefully can just keep getting better over time and therefore never needs to be repurchased, but also ends the nightmare of uh, data migrations and starts introducing at its heart simplicity, the same kind of simplicity that drove the movement towards storage as, or excuse me, software as a service that now can be applied to storage as well. And that's actually what we've tried to do here at Pure. And it isn't just a matter of, especially when we're talking about the management plane and how you manage your storage. Um, it's not just a matter of slapping another, you know, nicer looking or maybe a, a, a fancy UI on top of that already complex stack. What Pure did was start at the very beginning and make sure that everything was built from the ground up, not only to work together, but built on a common upgradable hardware platform, and most importantly, software platform as well, with simple unified infrastructure. And therefore that effortless management at any scale layer you see there right in the middle, um, really does um, you know, take effect and makes your day-to-day -day life as someone who's managing not only the data, but the storage that's supposed to be managing that data for you, introducing a far more automation and simplicity, um, and then being able to deliver that completely as a service. That's the philosophy that we've adopted here at Pure. And I wanted to give you that uh, context before I hand it over to Mike to tell us a little bit more about that management plane, the real subject that we're in in today, so that you'll have a context for why you know it's not just about grabbing another tool and using it with what you already have. What you really need to be looking for this in this new future is a new way of thinking about storage. So with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what Kevin, you know, emphasized around the simplicity, around management, automation. Uh, one other thing I do want to add to that, too, is we also strive at Pure to be non-disruptive, right? So one of the biggest things with storage uh, administrators is whenever they want to go through an upgrade or something like that, they always a little bit of paranoia there around, uh, you know, disruptions that can, that can occur. So what we've done is we've actually taken... Uh, some of the, the concerns that, that people have come to us with, and we put them together into uh, a control plane I think you'll be really interested in. Now, I want to start out with this a simple analogy. Uh, I think it really kind of brings home what we're trying to do. If you can all remember back far enough, uh, if you're older, uh, when you used to go to, uh, you know, drive around with your parents and go to the, go to the drive through restaurants, uh, pull up to the window, and you would have to be very specific about what you wanted because you had lots of options, lots of customization, and it really caused a, a slower experience all around. It caused, uh, you know, errors that could happen both on the provider side, which is, you know, the restaurant, um, but also on the customer side because the customer wasn't exactly sure what they had to order. And, you know, what they, the industry did to address that is they created something called combo meals. And the combo meals, as we know now, um, are really the easiest way to order, uh, you know, that fast food and even some other uh, types of, of, of uh, options that they have at restaurants. Now, in talking to storage administrators, most of them, you know, that I talked to knew what that whole uh, experience was like back then. Uh, we did talk to one storage administrator who's a little bit younger, and he said that, you know, combo meals have always been a thing and there's never been anything else, but, but we know better than that, right? Um, so now that you can get these combo meals, um, they're really standardized configurations. That's what, that's what the, the industry was going for. So when you go and order a number two or a number seven, you know exactly what you're supposed to get. And the industry knows exactly what to make you. You still have some options to customize as we all know, right? You can order your combo meal and you can specify you want, you know, maybe pickles or no pickles and you want, you know, small or large or medium or however you want it. Um, but it does lean itself towards, you know, a faster experience overall uh, for both, you know, parties involved and fewer errors because you're, you know, you're getting that standardized configuration. So when we took a look at what we could do with Pure, um, we looked at the same thing. We were looking at how can we make this easier and create standardized configurations uh, for storage administrators. 
make their lives easier uh, and to, you know, give your customer what they want. Your customer being your DBAs, uh, being, you know, the folks that are maybe doing AI uh, and, you know, so on. So we really tried to address these combos as more like location. Where should I deploy this? Where, where should this workload uh, um, or these, you know, files go? All right. We're looking at performance, capacity. Uh, then we look at configuration. Okay. Is, is there requirements? Do you have those requirements? Do you have configuration standards? Uh, you know, what, anything special that you need to do from a configuration standpoint. Then observability. Um, when you take a look at that, you're taking a look at, you know, actually how much capacity you're actually using planning. Okay. So you have to plan for capacity consumption. And then this performance, everybody wants to know metrics, you know, how fast are my IOs, how fast are things moving, how fast are, you know, things not moving. Um, and then data protection, we get down to the, the root cause of, you know, when you're looking at RPOs and RTOs um, and, you know, from Pure's uh, perspective, we've always kind of uh, leaned on, you know, hey, snapshots are the thing, right? Snapshots have always been a thing. It's the simplicity of a snapshot and safe mode. We've introduced that. Uh, in the last, you know, up to version uh, six. And that actually is a optune way uh, to help with things like ransomware and things like that. So we take a look at all those and these are kind of like our combo meals. These are kind of like the packages and it all comes down uh, to a single control plane. Now, when you take a look at that, it's not like other control planes. Other people, you know, would talk about control planes that are in the cloud. This is all on-prem. All right, it's within the purity operating system on the pure device. Okay, so it, it, it's all self-contained. You don't have anything going out, out to the outside world except when you're using the actual capacity planning uh, portion of it because that we utilize Pure One platform um, because Pure One does, you know, uses AI and helps you with capacity planning, helps you with, you know, uh, forecasting your, uh, your storage needs and things like that. So when we look at the sync control plane, we're looking at, you know, global policy management fleet wide. We're talking, we're talking about fleets of arrays, um, uh, pools of network storage. And this is global again. So you can create these pools and utilize them in geographical locations or any other type of uh, organizational way that you want. Um, intelligent storage that manages itself. When we make that statement, we're really taking a look at it from the stan uh, stance of automation. Uh, Pure Fusion is an automation engine, and what it does is it can automate, you know, where these workloads should go, uh, where it thinks the best placement is. Now, it's obviously, you know, you can make this fully automated, you can make it, you know, manual process, uh, but it's going to help you make those decisions. It's going gonna, it's gonna to guide you along the way. All right. So let's take a look a little bit um, here and on the automation piece. When you talk about automation, we want to say that automation, you don't have to automate because we're going to do it for you. If you whether you use uh, the GUI, the CLI, the API, the SDK, it does, really doesn't matter. You can use it on any array within a fleet. Okay, so it's a single pane of glass for multiple arrays. Now, we're talking arrays that can be a single array in a fleet. You can go uh, literally a thousand arrays within a fleet. Um, and it, we're really going down to the, the level of, of creating what we call catalogs, preset catalogs. They're kind of like service catalogs, if you're familiar with those. And it contains those customizations, right? Where, like we talked about before, where is that storage going to go? Uh, who is that storage going to service? What configuration items are necessary? Do I need data protection? Do I need safe mode? Do I have any restrictions around QoS? You know, uh, is quality of service a big thing? Um, and then we also have things like tags and labeling. So you can do chargebacks and things like that. Um, and then... We actually provision the workload. We can deploy it right from the catalog. And these catalogs are completely uh, addressable and definable by, by the user. Um, we do create, you know, obviously some uh, examples and presets. Uh, but then it's the uh, provision uh, workload is deployed. And what you get out of it is the complete orchestration by Pure uh, Fusion. Operational efficiency, risk mitigation, and the AI ops assistance and improved ob observability. I can't emphasize enough. Uh, about these four aspects, because this is really the core of what, you know, uh, we've heard from customers that are saying, hey, we want to be able to control our infrastructure, but we also want more simplicity involved and we want more AI. We want more, uh, you know, be able to see more metrics and understand what's going on. And this is where we come in and help.
So if you take a look at the platform itself, you know, we're talking about the first of a kind of automation. It's the entire, across the entire platform. When we talk about the pure platform, we're talking about multiple, uh, uh, you know, resources within uh, your storage infrastructure. Uh, this pure fusion is embedded in all pure arrays, okay? Starting with version 6.8, um, you will have uh, pure fusion embedded in your array once you upgrade. Uh, it will just be there and it will be on by default, all right? Uh, you can get aggregated fleet metrics, capacity, performance, utilization, all kinds of different things, and it all comes across in a fleet view. And you can simplify it, like I said, from one to a thousand arrays, and it doesn't really matter about the protocols. We're totally agnostic to protocols. Fusion doesn't care. Uh, and the reason why it doesn't care is because that's what Purity takes care of. Fusion is taking care of the automation portion. Purity, you know, uh, Fusion is taking care of that. Purity is taking care of all the little details if you will, around, you know, uh, what kind of protocols you're using and things like that. So um, it will be completely agnostic on that. Now, finally, when we take a look at uh, the platform, we also have to add Copilot, right? Because Copilot is something that we've developed that allows us to actually use AI uh, to help the administrator understand better how they can make their lives simpler in when they allocate storage or when they want to request you know, find out how much capacity they have. Um, I'm talking about, you know, different things that they can do, moving workloads, all that. So it really is a proactive way to stay ahead of the, of the threats, uh, you know, things like that, investigating incidents is like it says, and optimizing, optimizing workloads. Um, optimizing workloads has really been a key point that a lot of customers have, have hit on us about, you know, what can I do with my storage in terms of my storage sits there, but it's really slow. And I try and move it to another array, but it's still slow. AI Copilot can help you with that. It can go out and it can take a look at all of your different arrays across a fleet and be able to tell you, hey, it's your workload is going to be best optimized uh, on, uh, you know, in this location because we've analyzed all the IOs, we've analyzed the other workloads and things like that. And we think this is the best shot, uh, plus pace for it. And then you get, uh, you know, actionable steps to address the concerns. You know, it, 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 it replies to you. It tells you exactly what you want to know. Um, and it really is something that is, is evolutionizing, uh, you know, the, the, not only the pure platform from a, a storage perspective, but your entire infrastructure. Okay. Kevin? All right. Thanks, Mike. And I really appreciate you giving us a few more details on exactly what it means to have a management control plane that isn't just that and a GUI, but where it's integrated into all of the data management all the way through. And this is just a another example of how Pure has been a leader in storage and really helping reinvent um, the philosophy behind it uh, since our founding 15 years ago. Um, we just recently were named a leader for the 11th year in a row. And I think the most important point is that even Gartner themselves, what they're now looking at are storage platforms, not just individual storage appliances. And um, I think that's contributed to part of the reason why Pure is seen as such a leader there. The main you know, takeaway here is that Pure is a trusted vendor. We're not just you know, saying, hey, take our word for it. We've had a success and, and track record with our customers of them being able to have results like what you see here, real meaningful results that result in IT agility and being able to operate more efficiently and being able to focus more on innovation rather than just keeping the lights on. And let's face it, managing our storage that is the ultimate definition for a storage manager of just keeping the lights on as opposed to right. really being able to add value to the rest of the team. Yep. So, you know, whether it's, uh, as Mike said, no disruption, products that never go obsolete, not just from the financial side of not having to repurchase them, but not having any associated downtime. Again, just like you'd be used to with a hyperscaler. They don't take your systems offline when they do an upgrade behind the scenes. Uh, consolidating all your data together uh, and, and saving your team time, money, all of that together. And this really is that combo meal, as you said, Mike, <laughs> of <laughs> the fact that Pure has been focused on customer success from the very beginning. And that takes not just innovation and in technology, 
Um, and hey, we need to update this slide. This still has the 10 year number and and we've we just hit 11 earlier this month. Right. Um, you know, the evergreen business model and the subscriptions and the never obsolete nature of things that saves money. And then especially this focus on um, you know, customer success where uh, our you know claim to fame there is that we have the highest net promoter score NPS in the industry. And again, we listen to our customers respond and they love that about us and they they just love working with pure so for you to find out a little bit more about how you could leverage pure and get uh, uh get it to start solving some of your thorny data management and it problems you can go out to our website either use the qr code or just purestorage.com slash future uh, all the resources you need there to find out about what particular workloads, what we mean by a platform, and most importantly, how you could test drive um, things like you know our our management plane and and how that all works together. So, with that, uh, I thank you all for your time, Mike. Thank you again so much for uh, lending us your wisdom and your expertise today. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Mike. We 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 are at time here, so I'm going to have to say just a final thank you to you both for being here. And uh, any questions that are in the queue, those will get addressed after today's webinar. And that goes for any and all questions that you've posed today from the keynote onwards. Uh, if anything didn't get answered, I know we are... Uh, you know, ambitious in having Q&A, but of course there's more questions than we have time. So uh, thank you for being curious. Thank you for being inquisitive. And of course we will follow up uh, with you on all that information that you're seeking. Speaking of seeking additional information, I've got one final poll up for you as well here. And it is just asking if you'd like any additional information about the peer storage solution. So if, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and uh, just request what you're looking for. Data sheets, white papers, case studies, pricing, demos. It's all there. You know the drill by now. And um, if you haven't yet checked out the handouts tab, I would highly encourage you to do that now because we are about to wrap things up here in a couple minutes. Uh, here we've got a link to the future of storage so you can unleash the power of your data. It's an overview there and uh, also a link to get your storage evaluation kit from Pure. So if you like that, uh, you can definitely check it out there. We've also got, again, the handouts from all of our speakers today as well as some from us here at Actual Tech and for that future survey, which I'll call attention to once more before we wrap. Now, I've got our final prizes to give away here. So thank you for staying on and hanging out with us and learning today. Uh, and again, reminder, you do need to be live and present at the webinar to win. So our fourth and final gift card for $300 to Amazon is going out to Reed Varner from Nevada. And the third iPad Pro is going out to Patrick Chicote from California. Huge congrats, Reed and Patrick. And uh, I'm just going to recap all of our winners today. So if you stepped away for a minute, here we go. So the four gift cards went out to Kyle Howerton from Washington, Chris Austin from Tennessee, Mary Thurlong from North Carolina, and Reed Varner from Nevada. And the three iPad Pros went out to Michael Medeiros from California, Adam Hemphill from South Carolina, and Patrick Chicote from California. Alrighty, if you are on today's webinar and you are curious to present on a future summit, EcoCast or Megacast webinar, well, we would absolutely love to hear from you. You can reach out via email at connect at actualtechmedia.com and we can chat all about that. Again, I do wanna remind you about the future survey for 2025. If you are interested in filling that out, well, we'd absolutely appreciate it. Uh, it is in the handouts tab, the link, but also once we wrap this webinar, you are gonna be sent to that survey page. So if you've got time to fill it out, again, you're lending your voice and your insights, but you'll also have a chance to win a $1,000 gift card. So pretty hefty winnings there if you are selected for that. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I wanna thank our speakers from Couchbase, Rubrik, Cohesity, and Peer Storage. What a great crew today. 
for making this mega cast possible. And a special thank you to all of you for attending the mega cast, for asking some great questions and really bringing up the engagement around this conversation. I can imagine you're all very keen about IT innovation, exploring the tools, products, and services that enable the future. And I hope you've all gotten some interesting ideas and tips. I hope you feel a bit more informed or equipped to tackle and implement some of these opportunities at your organization. And most of all, I hope you had fun with me today. So before you take off, I would suggest you mark your calendars and come back to join us on another megacast, which is same time, same place next Wednesday, Wednesday, October 16th at 12 Eastern. This one is implementing an AI first enterprise transforming IT. So very much uh, akin to what we talked about today. We've already got six awesome presenting teams there. So if you're looking for more tools, more perspectives, definitely come check it out. And with that, uh, I hope to see you all again soon. And until then, I'm wishing you all an absolutely magical rest of your days. Take care, everybody.